Good morning, everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy. We're continuing with our fireside chats. And here we go. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Bless us that we may be constantly aware of your joyous presence within. We are your children. Guide us home to thee. Om. Peace. Amen. Um, Today we're going to talk about joy. I was remembering, uh, I know that a lot of these uh, talks that I've been giving have been quite serious. It's not that they've been without their humor or without their light moments, but a lot of the subjects that we've been dealing with, death, grief, karma, things like that, because we're in a bit of a a tough spot with this um, sheltering in place, with the virus epidemic, pandemic going around. There's just a lot that would take your cheeriness away from you. Um, But part of what the spiritual path is all about is to realize that nothing can take your cheeriness away from you. One of my favorite lines in the Bible, um, Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's warning them because he knows he's about to be crucified. And he knows that all of his disciples are going to, almost all of them faced martyrdom also. I believe almost all of them did, except for St. John. And he was exiled. It, it, as soon as Jesus died, um, it, it was not as if Christianity just went into the ascendant. There was a tremendous effort by the dark force to try to snuff out what Jesus had launched. Um, that's the way of this world. And it was Kali Yuga descending, which made it even a little worse. But it's the way of this world. There's a balance of light and darkness. It's not a purely light reality, the material plane. And different yugas are different. Um, but in any case, Jesus was telling his disciples that as time passed and people would recognize them as him, as them, as his disciples, he said, the world will hate you. He didn't, he didn't even make it small. He said, the world will hate you. But then he says, but be of good cheer. He says, I have conquered the world. And it's just, everything about that has always just delighted me. Oh, yes, you're going to have this happen and that happen, but be of good cheer because the, the power of spirit is greater than the power of darkness. And the power of spirit is not just a kind of, finally you you wrestle darkness to the ground and then you collapse exhausted from the effort, the actual um, uh, power that conquers the darkness is is the power of lighthearted joy. In 1978, let's see, let me get my years right. Yes, 1978, Swami Kriyananda went on um, two different nationwide tours. He, He crossed America back and forth twice in that year. And his subject was the practice of joy. And he gave dozens of lectures on the practice of joy because joy was really the answer to what everyone else was. uh, I mean, to to all our sufferings is, is not merely the passive sort of hope for joy, but the deliberate conscious practice of joy. And it's a, it's a fascinating sort of subject in itself. I'm going to start um, talking about this by reading from Swami's Affirmations for Self-Healing because he has two paragraphs here about joy. He says, true joy is not an emotional state. It is not that which one feels when some desire is satisfied or when everything at last goes well. It is inward. It is of the soul. It can be developed first by not reacting emotionally to outward things. These are the subtleties of joy that have to be understood. Don't be tossed about on alternating waves of success and failure. Don't join in their excitement the buyers and sellers in the marketplace of this world. 
be calm in yourself, even-minded and cheerful through the gains and losses of life. Then, in calm, deep meditation, feel the joy of the soul. Hold on to that joy through all activities. Don't confine it, but try ever to expand it until your little joy becomes the joy of God. And then Swami's affirmation, I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I know that joy is not outside me, but within. And then he says, in the calmness of meditation, at the heart of my inner peace, help me to feel thy thrilling, joyful presence. So what's important when we're talking about joy here is the relationship between joy and even-mindedness. And joy says, a uh, joy, Swami says that joy is not an emotional state. It's an, a state of inward calmness. So let's talk for a minute about the difference. Where we, where we stumble in our life is that we always think that circumstances will bring us joy. And then when circumstances start matching our desires and our expectations, we feel this rising sense of happiness because everything is going well. The difficulty with that is that, as Swami has often put it, it's uh, a success and failure, joy and happiness are waves on the ocean. And if, if, if the wave goes up on one side, there has to be a corresponding trough because the level of the ocean isn't changed. It's not like waves just go up and up. And all of us who've lived more than a minute have all sort of experienced in our life that there is just this ever alternating not, not merely events, but also feelings inside ourselves. When we allow ourselves to become very outward in our enjoyment, there's inevitably a, a, a period of time of, of letdown after that's over. If we've, defined, if we've defined the source of our happiness as outside ourself. And this is the great um, uh, gradual learning of the spiritual path. Master describe the eight manifestations of God, and one of them is joy. But joy as a manifestation of God is not from circumstances. It springs from our point of origin. It's what we're made of. Now, I'm wearing today what I have, but I don't always wear because of the microphones that I have to wear, which is this necklace is what we call the joy symbol. It's the, it's the logo, so to speak. It's the symbol of Ananda. Swamiji received this symbol in med meditation um, many decades ago, like in the late 70s. And this particular image, which I'm going to hold up in one that you can see even more clearly, so that it, it looks like this. This is something Swamiji said he prayed to Master. He said he wanted a symbol for Ananda that was expressive, that was simple, that could in and of itself convey, just by its, its very nature, convey the vibration of what Ananda was. And, in, and he said he went into meditation. Until that time, Ananda had various symbols. <clears throat> we had lotuses. We had somewhere there were people holding hands in a circle. There was the Om symbol inside a circle. Just different things that, that were... Um, that were assembled from elements that already existed. That's what I would say. That that these were all good symbols and we put them together in a way. And when you look at very old Ananda materials, that's what you see. You see these various symbols. But in that context, Swamiji knew that he was doing something that had never been done before. And that therefore, from the origin of what we were doing, some other reality was needed. So he prayed to Master to, to give him a symbol. And, and this symbol appeared to him in meditation. And then when he came out of meditation, he had to draw it. Because, of course, it wasn't a material object. It was just something he'd seen. And so Ami said he had to draw it about 70 or 80 times. Because there's tremendous subtlety in the way the, the lines are here. And he was able to come close to it, but it just took again and again before he was able to get it just the way he wanted it. And then what was interesting, the actual um, symbol, I don't, I don't know if you can see this or not, but he also put words on it. 
and it says, joy is within you. So for some reason, those words have gradually been left off, but it would say joy is within you, is how he actually wanted it to be, um, to help people to tune into what this meant. But after Swamiji um, drew it and had it in front of him, then he sort of looked at it to try to understand what it was saying. See, this is the marvelous thing about superconscious experiences is that they don't come rationally. They come fully blown sometimes, and then we have to sort them out. Einstein says that he perceived the theory of relativity. He just saw it. He understood it. He said then it took him years to sort of work it out and explain it and do and figure out the mathematics so that he could communicate it to other people. But the communication for him did not come in a rational line. It came first, and then he had to see what it meant. So Swamiji saw this first, and then he started talking about sort of what it looks like. And he talked about, this is the mountaintop, he describes. But he talks about how these graceful curves suggest that scaling the mountaintop is not arduous. You know, if, he, if it was a strong triangle like that, and you would see ourselves climbing up the peak with ropes, you know, and, and the, everything you need to make an arduous climb, that would convey a certain uh, relationship to our spiritual growth. But instead, it's a graceful curve. You can just see yourself with enough breath left over to sing while you scale the mountaintop, because, or you could skip, or you could dance, and you would be able to go barefoot. You wouldn't have to be dressed in layers of hard clothes to reach the mountaintop. And then once we reach the mountaintop, the way Swami described it, we expand and we, we, we continue upward in ever-expanding circles. Again, you see how the movement of that is? Anyone who dances or paints, you can just sort of feel that that's how you would go. Once again, it wouldn't, you know, this shape is not a gesture that looks like this. We don't have a heavy backpack on. We don't have our heads down. We reach the mountaintop. And once we reach the mountaintop, we're in, in exaltation. We, we make these enormous circles. And he says, again, we soar upward in ever-expanding circles, but then we also return down to, to from where we came. And Swami describes this, this part of it in several different ways. He said, one is... We climb upward, and then grace descends. So that this is the same in reverse. That this, this, the lines of this little arrow here, so to speak, or, the, or it looks like a bird, it's the same as this, except it's reversed. You see? So that grace descending to meet our efforts, and it's between, between the two. That's where the, that's where the power comes from. We're not merely walking upward, We're being lifted and we're being drawn upward by the power of grace. So this also suggests what we describe as a bird or a bird of paradise, which is flying free after the climb up the mountain, after the joyous expansion. Then this implies the freedom of a bird in his um, song channels, the, the, the song about nature, the verse about birds. Birds, birds sing of freedom as they soar lightly on the air. So may our hearts soar all above, high above all curbs and cares. So that's what the bird represents to it. Birds sing of freedom as they soar lightly on the air. So may our hearts soar all high above all curbs and cares. Now bear in mind, This is a symbol that's trying to describe what the spirit of Ananda is. Freedom, high above all curbs and cares, not this constant sort of arduous struggle. So, and also then, this is also the devotee himself, because a symbol has can be interpreted in many different ways. Swamiji is very much of the Indian school of scripture interpretation. Swamiji says when he first came to Master, and Master was um, interpreting scriptures, the Rubaiyat um, and the Gita, later the Gita. The Rubaiyat was the first that Swami was engaged with, and then the Gita. But he said the Western way of thinking 
is that we decide what something means. And it means this, and therefore it can't mean that. We consider it to be the height of achievement when we can pin it down to the final actual one. He said the Indian way of doing it is completely different. They would actually have sages and scholars come together to see how many different interpretations they could draw from one single verse of the Gita. And they would have uh, good-natured competitions. And if a sage could draw, as some did, a hundred different meanings from one verse of the Gita, it was considered the height of wisdom, where Westerners would think, why can't he just make up his mind? <laughs> and Swamiji said he actually had a little trouble when Master was interpreting the Gita at first, because Master would say, it means this, and then it means that, and then it means this, and then it means that. And so, I mean, the thought would come to him, can't he make up his mind? <clears throat> Swami describes that in his, his uh, autobiography. He describes that as a, a, a serious spiritual test he went through, because Master was so different than he expected it. All these doubts came to his mind. It was actually just something Swami had to go through. He said it was the remnant of lifetimes when he had doubted Master. So he said he never doubted Master's realization or his relationship as a guru, but began to wonder if Master was truly wise, is how he put it. But in any case, Swami's gotten over that long since. So it's also when the soul you know, experiences this great expansion, then it also wants to return and help others. And that, that is the greatness of, 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 of the avatars and the saints and the jivan muktas, is that they will just keep coming back. And in Buddhism, they have the bodhisattva, the one who just comes back and comes back and postpones indefinitely his, his or her own realization for the sake of helping others. Swami often says, it is the nature of joy to want to share itself. And he uses... That's some, one of his explanations sometimes, like, why did God create this world? And he said, it's the nature of joy to want to share itself. And Swamiji always had a way. He, he wouldn't just make pronouncements, but he would always give you a way to think it out for yourself. And when he would draw a conclusion, he would, he would tell you how he got to that point so that at the end, I mean, at the end, meaning the result of that training was we ourselves could discern truth from falsehood. We ourselves could make make in decisions based on intuition and attunement about things that we didn't have specific sort of precedence from Swami because he taught, excuse me, he taught us how to think. So when he said it's the nature of joy to want to share itself, he used a simple example. If you see a really good movie, what's the first thing you do? You call your friends. You write a little note out. Nowadays, you send an email. You put it on Facebook, whatever it is. I just saw a great movie. I went to a wonderful restaurant. You know, I ordered the, the mushrooms. You should especially order the mushrooms. They're so good. I mean, just think about it. Because when we, when we share our joy, we share it because it's more joyful for us. We bring all our friends into the party. Swami himself said that he's just... He, he said, he, how he put it was, I, I, I tell myself that if I can just explain it clearly enough, everyone will come onto the spiritual path. Everyone will want to. He said, I know that's not true, but it serves me to think that way because it, it inspires him to keep trying and to keep trying. So the fact that the the circle doesn't just go off like that. You see, it could have. It could have just gone off and pointed upward. The circle could have continued, but instead it stops, and it goes back down to meet those who are climbing up the mountain to put out a helping hand and to help them up. So this, Swamiji felt strongly, and it has been ever since, you know, this symbolically represents what Ananda is. It was very interesting. This was our symbol for a very long time. There was a slight period in the middle. Sometimes you will find on some literature from the 80s and the 90s that there's a slight variation on the way this looks. Somehow or another along the way, somebody cleaned it up for, for computerization and changed it. And then uh, sometime around 2000, someone noticed that it had been changed. <laughs> 
So this is what it actually looks like in case you ever, the other is stubbier, fatter and stubbier, but this is it. It was very interesting. This was our symbol for many years, but it never actually sort of rose to the level of perception until it was made into jewelry. It's, just, it's very funny how the material world works. It was on literature, it was on books, but somehow <clears throat> we ourselves didn't know it. <coughs> and then somebody had the bright idea of, of making it into jewelry. I think actually it was Tom Schott, if I'm not mistaken. I just want to give him credit. And once he started making it into jewelry and we started wearing it, then, it, then we began to identify with it in a very interesting way. <clears throat> think how many people wear the crucifix. And wearing the crucifix really defines you as a Christian. It defines you in your own self. Jews wear the Star of David. And self-realization is of Ananda often. We don't have to, of course. But you can wear this because it, it reminds us. And here's something that's really interesting because I have worn this for many years. Very often, very often actually, people will just look at it and say, that's so beautiful. And, and they don't really quite know why it's so beautiful. But, but something that's symbolic from a super conscious level actually carries in it an understanding that, that we ourselves receive. And we don't even know why we're receiving it. And I think that's what people have responded to sometimes when they've seen this symbol. symbol it speaks to them. You know, everything in this world, in fact, is a symbol of a greater reality. And the more and that is, um, that is part of, of what Master is trying to say when he's trying to say that, you know, joy is within us. Joy is inherent because joy is a manifestation of God. And this entire, everything in this creation is a manifestation of God. So Swami had the most beautiful way even of turning suffering, which is something that I've have meditated on a lot because, of course, the great challenge to joy is suffering, not just our suffering, but the perceived suffering of others. Now, the true arc, the true story of creation is not, you know, the arduous climb to the top of the mountain. It is the top of the mountain. And the struggle that we go through to get there is merely to, to extricate ourselves from all the false self-definitions that keep us from experienced joy. And sometimes we get quite confused and we start thinking that the path is the arduous effort to free ourselves of those self-definitions. We forget that the spiritual path is the gold of our own spirit. I remember a particular time at Ananda village. During, during those first decade, first 16 years of my spiritual life when I lived there, especially during the first decade, it was a smaller community and we were, we were very much able, it, it, was, it was a golden era in many ways, I have to put it that way, because it, it, there was just us. We were living there with Swami, we, all, we were all in the same place, we were more or less all focused in the same way. Swamiji himself, I remember he commented on the point, he said, there was a time, he said, when if I had an idea, I could redirect the whole of Ananda. In, toward whatever it was that I, I felt. He said, those days are long since past. Too many indiv individual vortices of energy. Inevitable. You become, it's the consequence of success when you begin to become uh, bigger and more people involved and have inspired more. It's, at one point, Swamiji said, we've simply passed the point uh, where we can, how did he put it? He said, where we can all be focused in one way. He said, we've become too big to be small. The only hope now is to become big enough to break into many smaller units again, which is more or less what has happened. You know, centers and meditation groups and different communities that we have each become its own vortex of energy. And even within that, as that community grows, it develops several vortexes. But going back to those first years at Ananda, I remember we had a community meeting. It was, it was without Swami. It was a meeting that we had to call. Everybody was feeling a little overwrought, is the only word I can use. Swamiji asked a great deal of us. We had to put out a great deal of energy. And for many of us, it was just learning 
to be able to consistently, joyfully put out that much energy. And the discussion was, how many of you just right now can think of four quotes from Master that talk about the arduous nature of the spiritual path, the do or die effort, the, the uh, with bleeding feet, I will persevere. Everybody raised their hand like that. And then someone, the same person asked, how many of you can think of four quotes from Master that talk about the joyous freedom of the spiritual path? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> it, they were all equally true. It was just that we had allowed ourselves to forget. And one of the one of the power one of the powers of of the company of a saint, whether you keep it um, through the internet these days or in person, is that the saints bubble over with joy at all times. And I, I mean, I had to work through this when Swami wasn't on the planet anymore. Because he would just, even though I didn't live with him for for most of my spiritual life, didn't live even in the same community, 16 years in the same community and the rest of that, um, I saw him often, I was in constant touch with him, but I was physically separated. But he would pass through, and he would just come in, and he would just bring this great big bubble of joy. And you would just sort of bask in that bubble of joy and it would carry you on. Now, Swamiji was working as hard as any of us and the tapasya that he had to go through, but he remained inside, never separating himself. Joy is within you. You see, those are the words that are written here. Joy is within you. That is the motto of Ananda. Ananda itself means bliss. And yes, we have to wash the mud of our delusion off of us to be able to live in that bliss, but the bliss is the point. And this is what I was going to say about Swami. Swamiji was completely aware of, of the trajectory of the spiritual path, that yes, we have to make put out this effort, but the reason we put out this effort is because every ounce of effort um, uh, liberates more and more of that inner joy. And it's the inner joy that really gives us the power to do this. Because that's what grace is. Grace is joy. Grace, When grace descends, what happens to us? Nothing seems to matter anymore. That's the experience of grace. Grace is, who cares what it took for me to get to here? Now that I'm here, nothing matters. And so when Swamiji would see people suffering, and he had a very tender heart, and people do suffer, you know, disappointment in love, disappointment in career, disappointment in health, disappointment in one's children, just disappointments abound. Swami would say, ah, he said, how much sweeter then will be the moment when all that falls away and the grace of God descends. That suffering becomes not the definition of the spiritual path, But this marvelous point of contrast compared to now comes the grace. In our festival of light, um, suffering and sorrow is given to strengthen us. Buffeting winds are given to strengthen us, like even shadows on a statue, as Hay puts it. The, The contrast between light and darkness. The darkness makes the light ever more beautiful. That gives light and substance to hope, is how it says in the Festival of Light. Isn't that a beautiful way to think of it? Joy is within us. And it's not, it's not a faraway reality. It's, a, oh yes, I forgot for a moment. Let me remind myself. Let me wear the symbol. Let me look at the symbol. Let me say it to myself. Joy is my nature. And I want to end by reminding you, Master's Poem Samadhi. I, I had memorized that poem and recited it for years before it really, I really realized we go, you know, veils of light and shade, the entire cosmos is within me, anger, greed, good, bad, salvation, lust, I swallowed and transmuted all powerful, huge, incredible images. It all ends, a tiny bubble of laughter, I am become the sea of mirth itself. All of cosmic consciousness, all of God, 
a bubble of laughter in a sea of mirth. No matter what comes, let us remember that. Our freedom lies in the practice of joy, for joy is within us. God bless you.